the canonization by john dunn scholar and writer priest and poet lawyer and politician womanizer and family man john dunn is one of the most fascinating figures in english literature the canonization of john dunn is an all time favorite of literature buffs this is the second time i teach the canonization before the video camera but the two occasions could not have been more different from each other last time i found myself teaching the canonization in a classroom this time i teach the poem in a studio last time i taught the canonization with my students in front of me this time i am compelled to imagine that my students are in front of me last time i taught just the first line of the poem or to be more exact the first two lines this time i plan to teach the entire poem last time i was quite relaxed i find the atmosphere of a classroom relaxing this time i am rather tensed because i have to pack as much material as possible within the given time frame let us take a look at the title of the poem the canonization what is the meaning of the word canonization canon means list you have the canonical books of the bible canon means official list canon means a list which is officially approved in the context of this poem canon means the list of saints officially published by the catholic church canonization is the long drawn complex process by which a person is declared a saint i repeat canonization is a long drawn complex process by which a person is declared a saint mother teresa of calcutta has been canonized she is now known as saint teresa of calcutta the impression that the title of the poem gives is that it is a very religious poem it is about how saints are made but when you read the poem in fact when you read the first line of the poem your expectations are shattered you realize that it's a very secular poem you realize that it has a very worldly theme you realize that it deals with unholy matters thus using the title the poet raises certain expectations and then dashes them to the ground the contradiction between the title and the body of the poem 
the contradiction between the title of the poem and the body of the poem. In fact, the contradiction between the title of the poem and the first line of the poem itself is one of the great strengths of the poem. Let us read the poem, stanza by stanza. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me laugh. Or chide my palsy or my gout, my five grey hairs or ruined fortune flout. With wealth your state, your mind with arts improve. Take you a course, get you a place, observe his honour or his grace, or the king's real or his stamped face, contemplate what you will approve. So you will let me laugh. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me laugh. Look at the opening line of the poem. How it deliberately and shockingly shatters the expectations raised by the title of the poem to the effect that the poem is a religious poem. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me laugh. The poem is addressed by a lover to a friend. The friend being a very sincere and a very loyal friend objects to the romance in which the speaker is entangled. He always advises the speaker against conducting the romance. This poem is the response of the speaker to this attitude of the friend. What does the poet say? For God's sake, hold your tongue. In the name of God, hold your tongue. In the name of God, don't speak and let me laugh. Or chide my palsy or my gout. What is chide? Chide means scold. Chide means rebuke. Chide means verbally attack. Or chide my palsy. What is palsy? Palsy means paralysis. Or chide my palsy or my gout. Gout is joint pain related to arthritis. Related to rheumatism or chide my palsy or my gout, the speaker advises his friend to make fun of his paralysis, his ill health or his gout, his ill health. It is very unusual for a person in love to speak about his own ill health. That is the brilliance of Dan. This is a love poem. The subject of the poem is the speaker's romance and in this poem whose subject is the speaker's romance, the speaker speaks about his ill health, about his palsy, about his gout. My five grey hairs or ruined fortune flout. The speaker does not claim to be a handsome person. Very unusual for a lover, very unusual in a love poem. The speaker has only five hairs and the hairs are grey. My five grey hairs or ruined fortune flout. If I were to write this poem, I would say my five dyed hairs. My five grey hairs or ruined fortune flout. Flout means mock. Flout means make fun of. The speaker is in a very poor financial shape and he requests his friend to make fun of his hopeless financial situation. To make fun of his five hairs which are grey. The poet has provided the canonization with a remarkable opening, a striking opening, 
an opening which knocks the reader off his balance and captures his attention. And the speaker does something very extraordinary. He speaks about his own ill health, his own financial misfortune, his own lack of handsome features at the very opening of this poem whose subject is the speaker's romance. Now the poet gives his friend a series of positive suggestions. With wealth your state, your mind with arts improve. Why don't you make money? Why don't you improve your financial position by gathering wealth? Or improve your mind by studying the arts? Take you a course, get you a place. A series of very positive suggestions. The speaker advises his friend to take a course. Take you a course. What is the meaning of this word course? Course can mean many things. It can mean direction. Course can mean an academic program. Course can mean a course of medicine. What is prescribed by the doctor. Course can mean part of a meal. Take you a course. The word course has many meanings. And practically all the meanings of the word course are perfectly applicable to this context. This is an example of the brilliant manipulation of multiple meanings by Dunn. Get you a place, find for yourself a position, observe his honor or his grace. Who is his honor? His honor is a judge. You must have seen it in movies. Note the point, Your Honor. Objection, Your Honor. Honor means a judge in the subordinate judiciary. In the high courts, in the Supreme Court, a judge is addressed as Your Lordship or My Lord. A district judge or a sub judge or a munsif or a magistrate is addressed as your honor. Observe, observe his honor or his grace. Who is his grace? A duke is addressed as your grace. His grace means a duke or maybe an archbishop. An archbishop is addressed as your grace. A duke is a high-ranking nobleman. An archbishop occupies a high position in the church. Or the king's real or stamped face. Why don't you rise higher, suggests the poet. Focus attention not on a judge, not on a nobleman, but on the king himself. Or the king's real. Look at the king himself. But it's not quite possible to look at the king. If you are not capable of, if you find it impossible to look at the king, at the king's real face, look at its stamped face. Look at the face of the king stamped on the coins. Collect coins. Keep looking at them. Keep looking at the face of the king stamped in the coins. Contemplate what you will approve, so you will let me laugh. The poet says, you can contemplate, you can think, you can focus attention on, you can observe whatever you want. I have only one request of you. Allow me to love. Permit me to love. Thus, in the first stanza, the poet gives a number of suggestions to his friend. Some of them are negative suggestions, like making fun of the ill health of the poet, making fun of the ruined finances of the poet, making fun of the lack of 
handsome features in the physique of the poet. Some of them are positive suggestions like taking a course, like improving the mind with the arts. Some of them are suggestions with ironic possibilities like focusing attention on judges, noblemen and the king. The point is the speaker wants to be allowed to laugh. The listener can do whatever he wants as long as he permits the speaker to laugh. Alas, alas, who is injured by my laugh? What merchant's ships have my sighs drowned? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my coals a forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? Soldiers find wars and lawyers find out still litigious men which quarrels move though she and I do love. The second stanza has a striking opening line. Alas, alas, who is injured by my love? Alas is an exclamation expressing regret, grief, pity. Alas, alas, who is injured by my love? The poet wants to know in what way anybody in this world is damaged, injured by his love. Why all this objection? What merchant's ships have my sighs drowned? A sigh is a deep breath. When you are in love, you sigh repeatedly and often for no reason. The poet asks whether any ship of any merchant, whether any cargo vessel has been drowned by his sighs. It is true that he sighs often and perhaps also sighs for no reason. But has any cargo vessel capsized because of his sighs? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When you are in love, you tend to act irrationally. You cry for no reason. The poet is no exception to this. He cries. He admits that he is in love and he admits that he cries. But have his tears generated a flood which has flooded anybody's compound? In what way is anyone affected negatively because of the romance of the poet? Is love cold or is love heat? Love is both cold and heat. The poet says that he experiences both the cold and the heat of love. But the cold of the love that he experiences has not upset the seasons, has not prevented the coming of spring. Similarly, the heat of the love that the poet experiences has not added any new figure to the plaguey bill. The plaguey bill is a list of persons killed by plague. It is true that love is both cold and heat. It is true that the poet experiences both the cold and the heat of love. But the cold of love, the heat of love do not create problems for other people. Soldiers find wars and lawyers find out still litigious men whom quarrels move though she and I do love. The life of this world goes on smoothly as before. Soldiers find wars. In Dunn's time, soldiers were paid only when there was war. 
and, and the soldiers were very unhappy when there was no war because they were not paid. Dunn says, soldiers find wars and lawyers find out litigious men. Litigious men are men prone to litigation who file cases in courts and keep the lawyers busy and keep the lawyers paid. Though she and I do love. The point of the poet is that the life of this world the life of this world goes on smoothly despite the romance of the speaker and his woman and nobody in this world has the right to object to this romance. Let us take one more look at the lines. The poet says that his sighs have not drowned cargo vessels. The poet says that his tears have not flooded anybody's compound. One wonders whether the poet is suggesting that his love is so powerful that it can actually achieve these things. Is the poet trying to suggest that the frequent sighs, the meaningless sighs of his are capable of letting loose tempests and drowning merchants' ships. Is the poet trying to suggest that the frequent tears, the meaningless tears of his are powerful enough to generate floods, to flood the compounds of people? It is true that the cold and the heat of his love have not created problems for others. One wonders whether the poet is trying to suggest that his love, his romance has supernatural powers, that the cold of his love has the capacity to upset the seasons, that the heat of his love has the capacity to add names to the plaguey bill. Call us what you will, we are made such by love. Call her one, me, another, fly. We are tapers too, and at our own cost die. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. The phoenix riddle hath more wit. By us, we too being one, are it. So to one neutral thing, both sexes fit. We die and rise the same, and prove mysterious by this love. As the third stanza begins, a mood of defiance overcomes the lovers. The poet says, call us what you will. You are free to call us whatever you want. And we accept that we are what you call us. The poet even goes further. He even suggests the names that can be used by the listener can be used by the listener to ridicule him and his woman. Call her one, me, another, fly. The poet says that his friend can ridicule him by calling him names. He does not mind. He even accepts that he is what he is called. He goes one step further and declares that she can be called a fly. Call her one, me another fly. Call my woman a fly. Call me a fly. Why fly? What is the meaning of the word fly? Fly can be butterfly. The most romantic of flies. Fly can be dragonfly, which picks up a pebble, just as the lover picks up his woman. Fly can be firefly, which spreads light and joy in the night, just as lovers spread light and joy in the night of this world. Fly can be housefly. Perhaps that is the most appropriate explanation. 
the house fly is a very common insect. Love is a very common emotion. House flies tend to wheel around each other. Lovers tend to wheel around each other. House flies are looked upon as dirty creatures. Lovers are looked upon as dirty creatures by others. Some editors think that the word is not fly, but sly. Sly means cunning, sly fox. Sly is usually used as an adjective. If sly is used as a noun here, it is for the first time and also the last time in the history of English poetry. Above all, fly or sly can be the nickname used by the speaker and his woman for each other. Can be the nickname that the lovers use to address each other. When you are in love, you generally don't call the person you love using his formal name. You have your own name for that person. Fly or sly could be such a name. We are tapers too and at our own cost die. What are tapers? Tapers are thin candles, candles. Tapers burn, tapers give light, tapers produce warmth. That is how love is. Love produces light and love produces warmth. And love is sacrifice. The taper burns itself out in order to produce light and warmth. Love burns itself out in a sense of self-sacrifice. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. The eagle and the dove. What is the poet trying to convey? By bringing in the eagle and the dove? The eagle is the strongest of birds. The dove is the meekest of birds. Love is both strength and meekness. Eagle could stand for the male principle. Dove could stand for the female principle. The eagle flies in the sky. The dove transcends the sky to reach heaven. In Christian mythology, the dove symbolizes the love of God, the love of God for man. The phoenix riddle hath more wit. By us, we two being one are it. These are among the most famous lines written by Dunn. The phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. The phoenix riddle is explained better because of us. We two being one are it. So to one neutral thing both sexes fit. Why does the poet bring in the phoenix? The phoenix is a mythological bird. Is done trying to suggest that true love is also mythological? The phoenix is the rarest of the rare birds. Because there is only one phoenix at a time. Is done trying to suggest that true love is very rare? The phoenix lives in Arabia. The phoenix lives in the deserts of Arabia. Is done trying to suggest that love always exists in a hostile environment? The phoenix rises from the ashes. Is done trying to suggest that love has the capacity, love has the power to rise from the ashes of destruction. The lovers in the final act of love are one in body and soul, like the phoenix. There is only one phoenix at a time, so the phoenix is neither male nor female. Or, more exactly, it is both male and female. It is hermaphrodite. The lovers in the final act of love 
are one in body and soul and like the phoenix, both male and female, hermaphrodites. At the close of the stanza, the poet says that the lovers die and rise the same and prove mysterious by their love. Like the phoenix dying, like the phoenix burning itself to ash and rising from the ash, rising anew from the ash, lovers die and then come back to life. Love has the power to transcend death. But it should also be remembered that to die was an Elizabethan and Jacobian slang which meant to have sex. Sex is tiring but it is also regenerating. The closure of the stanza celebrates the magical power of love. The power of love to transcend destruction. The mysterious capacity of love to go beyond death. The lines in the stanza about the Phoenix Riddle are an excellent example of the metaphysical conceit. The word conceit is related to the word concept or idea. The metaphysical conceit is a figure of speech in which a long-drawn and detailed comparison is worked out between two things which in the ordinary course of matters would never ever be brought into comparison. Dr. Johnson complained in his Lives of Poets that in the metaphysical conceit the most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. The lines discussing the Phoenix Riddle exemplify Dunn's brilliant use of the metaphysical conceit. Whoever thought that the phoenix which exists only in the deserts of Arabia, the phoenix which exists only in mythology can be brought into comparison, can be brought into conjunction with lovers especially lovers in the act, in the final act of love. We can die by it, if not live by love, and if unfit for tombs and hers or legend be, it will be fit for worse. And if no piece of chronicle we prove, we'll build in sonnets pretty rooms, as well a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as half-acre tombs, and by these hymns all shall approve us canonized for love. In the penultimate stanza, the poet declares that if the lovers are not allowed to live as lovers, they are prepared to die as lovers. The poet accepts that he and his woman are ordinary persons. They may not be fit for tombs. A tomb is a monument to a dead person. They may not be fit for hers. A hers is a funeral carriage. But the story of the speaker and his woman will be fit for worse. They may not be the stuff that history is made of. They may not find a place in the chronicles of the times, but they will find a place in the poetry of the times. The poet declares that if history decides to ignore them, if the chronicles decide to ignore them, 
they will be able to catch the attention of literature they will be able to catch the attention of poetry he explains that a well wrought urn becomes or suits the greatest ashes as half acre tombs an urn is a vessel for holding ashes if it is well made if it is well crafted the poet says that it can become or it can shoot the greatest ashes as half acre tombs one is here reminded of the seminal new critical text the well wrought urn by cleant brooks the love poems written by the poet will become the hymns or the prayer songs of the new religion of love and he and his woman will be canonized they will be declared saints not saints of the catholic church not saints of the christian religion but saints of the church of love but saints of the religion of love and thus in workers you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage you to whom love was peace that now is rage who did the whole world's soul contract and drove into the glasses of your eyes so made such mirrors and such spies that they did all to you epitomize countries towns cold speck from above a pattern of your love thus the speaker and his woman have been declared saints have been canonized have become the saints of the religion of love in the last stanza the poet imagines the lovers of the future invoking him and his woman as a catholic would invoke a saint what do the lovers of the future say as imagined by the poet love to the speaker and his woman was like a hermitage love is a hermitage in this world of tension in this world of conflict in this world of struggle love offers peace love offers tranquility love offers protection the lovers of the future admit that their love is rage their love is violent their love is lacking in peace but the speaker and his woman attained the highest form of love for whom love was tranquility love was peace love was protection when a true lover looks into the eyes of his beloved he sees not just the eyes but the entire world this is what happened to the speaker and his woman they looked into each other's eyes and saw the world in them the speaker refers to mirrors and spies spies are telescopes this poem must have been written around 1630 i think it was published for the first time around 1633 telescopes had just been invented and dun refers to the newly invented telescope in the last stanza of the poem this shows that the metaphysical poets were scholars who positioned themselves at the cutting edge of information they were information junkies long before the information age the lovers of the future will invoke the speaker and his woman and beg from them a pattern of their love the love of the speaker and his beloved 
will become a model, will become a paradigm for the lovers of the ages to come. Let us look at the canonization from the stylistic point of view. I often tell my students, if you want to know what is metaphysical poetry, read the poetry of John Donne. And if you want to know what is the poetry of John Donne, read the canonization. The canonization is the archetypal metaphysical poem. What are the features of metaphysical poetry that are displayed by the poem? First of all, the poem has an abrupt beginning, a shocking beginning, which knocks the reader off his balance and captures his complete attention. The poet uses everyday diction. The poet does not use poetic diction. The poet does not use romantic diction. The poet adopts a conversational tone. There is nothing musical about the lines. On the other hand, the rhythms are rough. The rhythms are prose-like. The poem stands out for its argumentative mode. There is systematic reasoning in the poem, step-by-step -step logic in the poem, sort of things which you never come across in many other English poets. Dunn brilliantly makes use of the metaphysical conceit. The metaphysical conceit is a long-drawn comparison between two incomparable things. Two things which would otherwise never be brought into conjunction are brought into juxtaposition in the metaphysical conceit. The best example of the metaphysical conceit in this poem is the phoenix riddle. The poet says that the riddle of the phoenix can be explained better in the light of the experiences of the speaker and his woman as lovers. The canonization consists of five stanzas of nine lines each. The poet is rather careless in metrical matters. The poet does not follow the rules of English prosody religiously. This can be looked upon as a hallmark of the poetry of Dunn and a hallmark of metaphysical poetry in general.